Hello, my name is Jacob and I am a Norse pagan. And today I want to share with you how to create your own rituals from the very beginning and how to respect your source materials along the way. We're also going to be discussing this along with the ritual I recently performed in England at our gathering there where I covered myself in head to toe in mud. So stick around for the whole video so you can see the reason why I covered myself in mud and see how you can create your own rituals as a Norse pagan. Now remember, all this information is kind of just my own personal interpretation of how to perform a ritual. We really don't have a guidebook on how to perform a heathen ritual, a Norse pagan ritual. These are all things that have been kind of rediscovered in the last 50 or so years. And so none of this is really going to be historically accurate. While we're still honoring the source material, we know very little about historical heathen rituals and what we do know is very hard to implement in our modern day lives simply because the world has changed. Uh, so just keep an open mind as we go through this information that this is my advice to you that does have historical backing but it's nearly impossible to do a 100% historical heathen ritual in the modern day. Now, as far as the historical source materials go, this is really the roots. So we're gonna go with the tree metaphor through this video. Uh, so the roots of your tree are going to be the historical sources. What are you basing this ritual on? And I think this is really necessary because without roots, we have nothing. And so you need the roots. Uh, now these roots can be Nordic roots, they can be Celtic roots or whatever flavor or variety of roots you want, uh, but ultimately you need them. So decide what you want for the root of this ritual. In the case of the mud ritual, uh, the root of that, of why I covered myself in mud, is to resemble the dead being raised by Odin and even Freya to discuss prophecy. That might not make sense to you, but that made sense to me. And that's why I wanted to perform the ritual like this, is to enact myself as one of these dead being raised by Odin to speak prophecy on behalf of the ancestors and the dead. And so that was my roots, and that's what the tree was going to come out of. Now, whenever you're performing a ritual, I really encourage experimentation. Again, have the historical backing, but see where it takes you, because ultimately you can be like, okay, here's the root, here's the foundation. Let's see where it goes. Let's see how far the tree grows. Now, as far as the growing of the tree to ensure that it grows well, your ritual tree grows well, understand that you need to bring in multiple elements. And the more elements you bring in and are more comfortable with, the tree will grow taller. Now, I highly recommend if you're just getting into this practice today, don't try to grow a massive tree overnight. Don't become a pagan on Monday and expect to do these massive rituals on Tuesday. Take your time. I've been doing this for, I think, over six years now, and I'm just now getting to the point where my rituals are really in-depth and have multiple layers to them, such as covering yourself in dirt. Now, the covering yourself in dirt, that was actually part of that conceptualization process of understanding how to grow the tree as tall as possible. So I saw dirt as a connection to the ancestors because at the end of the day, when we die, we become dirt. And so that was the acknowledgement of actually rubbing the dirt on my skin, acknowledging that one day I will be in the ground where I will return back to the natural world. And so actually handing that to people in the ritual space and saying, you know, connect with the ancestors, you are acknowledging that one day you will return to the dirt just like your ancestors did, no matter where your ancestors came from. Now, also the building of this tree is to make sure your tree doesn't bend and fall over and go 20 different directions. And so another part of creating a ritual is keeping the elements in there that keep you safe. Because let me tell you, this faith is real. Rituals are real. Magic is real. Maybe not fireballs, but magic is very real. And if you don't put in those things to protect yourself before a ritual, um, especially if you're doing something in depth, like resembling the dead that Odin raised in order to speak with the ancestors, you might end up hurting yourself spiritually. And at best, maybe the ritual doesn't work, but at worst, maybe you can actually spiritually harm yourself or, you know, get trapped in the trance. And trust me, it's real. Like, um, you know, it can happen if you don't perform the ritual right or don't put in those things to actually protect you. And that's why, again, it's important to start small. Now, in the case of the ancestor ritual, I don't actually have footage of this. I don't believe so. Uh, but the things that I put in place that actually protected me uh, was all my pre-ritual. I had about a 30, 40 minute pre-ritual before everyone came out and I handed out the mud. And so mostly this was calling out to the gods to ask for the protection, to ask for their, you know, watching of the ritual, to calling to my spiritual teachers in the sense of Freya is my shamanic teacher. So calling out to Freya giving an offering to Freya as well. And then all my necklaces as well that I was wearing during the ritual represent another form of protection. 
Of course, my Mjolnir represents protection of the gods, protection of the Nordic deities. Uh, and then I had a turkey talon given to me as a gift by a member of the community. And I used that to represent my Filgia, my spirit guide that protected me as well. Now, if you're wondering about things such as Philly, I'll be talking about them very soon in my explorations into Nordic shamanism and talking about that here on the channel. So make sure you like and subscribe and all that good stuff uh, so you're notified when those videos come out. Uh, they should be really good and should be coming out here very soon. Now, another element I had on there was actually a necklace with an ancestor, like an antler on it that someone in the community made as well. And so to connect me to the community even further. So all of these elements coming together saying, you know, these are here to protect me, acknowledging their protection, giving offerings to the gods, giving offerings to the ancestors, all of these things coming together to create a safe space for myself. I also set those boundaries within this mud ritual to say when the mud is on my body, that is when I'm connected to the ritual. Once the mud is off of my body, I am returning. And so at the end of the ritual, that's why it was very important for me to start shaking off the mud, uh, getting it off of my body, and then eventually getting sprayed down by someone who was a little too excited to spray me down. <laughs> but it did take a few days to get the mud off of myself. But I did notice the more I got the mud off of me, the less connected I felt to that ritual, uh, which means, the, you know, in a sense, it worked. When I tell you this, you might be like, oh, well, that seems nonsensical. But to me, it worked. And to me, that was the element that kept me connected to the dead, to the ancestors, was covering myself in dirt. Now, another element of building the trunk here is actually understanding what you're going to be doing before you perform the ritual and let it blossom and bloom. I like this metaphor. Anyways, so the actual building of the foundation and, and building up from the roots uh, is understanding what you're actually going to say. Uh, and I think, you know, if you want to write things down, I recommend this to some people. I've done it before in the past. I don't think you want a full script because you, don't want, to, you want the, the natural process to flow once you actually perform, uh, but really understanding, you know, what you're going to do. And so for me in this mud ritual was, okay, I need mud, so I'm going to go get mud. It was, okay, I need to do a pre-ritual to protect myself, so get the pre-ritual elements put together. And then I also kind of determined the main points of what I wanted to bring up. But I left so much room for, you know, creativity in the moment because that's really, in my opinion, how I like to perform rituals is I allow the energy to kind of flow through me. I allow the words to come to me during the ritual. Uh, I just have to make sure I have those, those beats, those big moments uh, to make sure I cover them in the ritual itself to make sure it works. And so typically, I've talked about this before, it's the ritual sandwich. You have the beginning where you're saying, welcome the gods, welcome the deities. And then you have the content in the middle, what you actually want to talk about, the purpose of the ritual. And in the case of this ancestor ritual, it was to share with the ancestors the world that we live in now and to celebrate with them because our lives are so much easier than we remember. It's so much easier than our ancestors actually went through and that we should be honored to live in this time, even though it is very difficult because of the craziness of the world. But at the same time, we don't have to struggle for the things that our ancestors struggled for. So that was really the heart of the ritual here. And then at the end, closing off that ritual sandwich, <laughs> I realize my metaphors are so weird, but I hope, I hope they're helpful to you. So anyways, at the bottom of the ritual sandwich is the closing of the ritual. And so those three elements are part of the trunk, are part of building this ritual and understanding that you need those in order for the ritual to be success for yourself and anyone that is participating in the ritual with you. Now, the actual branch part of the ritual. Uh, so this is something that, you know, in the group ritual versus a solitary ritual, it's going to be very different. But I think what the biggest advice I have here is if you mess up, don't freak out. It's okay. Uh, so for the people practicing by themselves, if you feel like you, you stumble over your words, if you feel like you've forgotten what to say, if you have long moments of silence, it's okay. I don't think the gods necessarily care as long as you're just sitting there reflecting on the deities itself, themselves. Now, another thing is you're going to get distracted and you know, there's ways to prevent that as well. Obviously during group rituals, I don't have my phone on me, typically because I'm recording, but also I highly recommend not having your phone on you uh, to distract you from what you're supposed to be doing, what, you're, what the reason is for you being there. Uh, additionally, if you're personally practicing, don't have that phone nearby. When I sit at my altar and I talk to the gods, I chuck that phone across the room so it doesn't distract me. Just having it there, need, the need to reach for it, get rid of it from the equation. Uh, and that's just a way to help you during your ritual itself. But also don't feel bad if you do get distracted. Just get back to the moment. Just like in meditation, if you lose count of the breath, if you stop focusing on the breath, just return to it and it's gonna be okay. And also, I think this is why I'm really big on, again, of course, having historical roots, but allowing yourself to evolve the practice because this is not Christianity. This is not Catholicism or a Catholic rite. Uh, you know, performing something 100% exactly perfection 
just doesn't exist. And so don't put yourself to that standard of needing, needing to perfect it. Uh, you know, take notes. You know, after you're done performing it, if you feel like you messed up in a certain category, just remember it for next time. The next time you perform that ritual uh, or the next time you perform a different ritual, think about the things that didn't work. Uh, but don't, don't worry about it in the moment. So for me during this mud ritual, uh, when I was going around, one of the things I had to come up with is the voice I wanted to use for this ritual. Now, it was very different than any ritual I performed in the past. And again, I don't have a book telling you, you know, this is how the dead speak, kind of. But when I was sitting there preparing myself for everyone to arrive, I did have to think about, how am I gonna sound? Am I just gonna talk like this, like I normally do, my happy chipper self? Like, hello, we're here to worship the Norse gods. We're here to cover ourselves in mud. That didn't feel right. Um, and I, I've bounced back and forth uh, more theatric in the past than I think I am now, but I really had to think, okay, what do the dead sound like? Put yourself in the mind of someone who was dead and then has been risen from the dead to speak once again. Your voice is going to be hoarse. Your voice is going to be dry. It's going to be weak because you haven't spoken in so long. And so I'm like, okay, that's my voice. I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to shout because I can't. I just woke up from the dead. And so my voice is going to be weak. Uh, and that's why this ritual was fairly quiet as I moved around the circle. This fire represents what still remains. The world long changed. Of earth long unblessed. Odin, join us here. Freya, join us here. Tree, you're listening. I hear them. And I also think it acknowledges that this is a different moment. Uh, so I guess here I'll insert, do you speak to the gods in your mind or with your voice? So I think there is a very different consensus on this within the community, uh, within paganism in general as well. And I'm not going to say anyone is wrong for how they communicate to the gods. I just personally recommend using your voice to communicate with them. Now, let me tell you why I think that is. Because voice is so important to our ancestors. Spoken word, poetry, and singing are the ways that they communicated to the deities, uh, but also to each other. Remember, most people in the past were not literate, so actually reading was not something that they were common to. And to us that read all the time, I find that you know us thinking just makes more sense because we read things, uh, and therefore we're thinking words all the time. But I do think that the ancestors of the past would have relied more heavily on spoken word when speaking to the gods themselves. And really looking at the elements of the historical past within the Celtic, you had bards uh, in uh, the Order of the Druids as well, had bard, uh, bards that sang songs and, and learned uh, the spiritual word. And again, Druids only pass things down orally, so they had to communicate with the voice. So I have no doubt that when they communicate with the gods, they use their voice. And in the terms of the Nordic skalds, the skald is one of the most recognizable figures outside of like, you know, Ulf Hednar or, you know, the Viking warrior, uh, because skalds are the reason we have anything in the poetic Edda, because these skalds would travel around uh, the Scandinavian region, sharing stories of the gods, of heroes, of kings, uh, and using their voice to communicate. Now, again, there are many people out there, I think there's actually more people out there, that prefer to communicate with their thoughts. That is fine if that works for you. Um, just really focus your thoughts. I think that's where actually taking the time to really focus in your thoughts and not let your mind get scattered is going to be the key there. Uh, but I hope I've been able to kind of share with you why I think the voice is very important. Historically, I think the voice would have been used more, and it's only in our more internalized modern age that we're using our thoughts more to communicate with the gods. So let me think of some wrap-up things here as far as the roots of this. Uh, really just don't overstress yourself. Once you actually perform in the ritual, Actually, I have another metaphor for you. Uh, so we're gonna use the roller coaster metaphor. In a ritual, you have the roots, you have your tree, you have built your roller coaster. And all you have to do once you start performing that ritual is ride that roller coaster. You ain't changing nothing once you start riding it. And I actually use this advice with Terry in our community who put on the English gathering and soon will be putting on another English gathering and then hopefully a Scotland gathering. Uh, I told him at the point of performance, once you get to the point you're actually performing the ritual, that's it. You gotta go. Don't worry about any of the details. You can't change them. You're in there, you're on for the ride, and just let it take you. And honestly, I think that's one of the best pieces of advice I've given anyone when it comes to uh, ritual practice, is once you're there, you just gotta go. And if you feel like you weren't prepared enough, then you just have to go back and think about it the next ritual you perform. And maybe that's the best part to leave the branch section, is okay, you've grown your tree, you've built your roller coaster, you've made your sandwich. 
at the end of the day, all you can do at the end is enjoy it. And then prepare for that next one, prepare for that next sandwich, prepare for building that next roller coaster, prepare to plant the next tree. Uh, this is a lifelong practice, and I think ritual is one of the most important parts about this religion. And so performing rituals, whether it's in your house, communicating within your thoughts, or speaking with others is very important. So as this video is finishing, thank you so very much for joining me, and I do hope that it was helpful to you. All these names coming down right here are the most amazing people in the world because they are the ones that support this channel. So thank you to everyone running down this list, and I, I really do hope this video uh, will help you build your ritual practice. I guess the final thoughts I'll say on the mud rituals, I do feel like it was very successful because going into it, I had no idea. that I had no basis of information to say whether this was going to work or not. This is really something I had to create from scratch and then see how it went. And by the end, I think it was very successful. I think everyone had a very primal experience. I think everyone really enjoyed the mud aspect to actually have something to put on their body to signify they were in a ritual mindset to connect them with the ancestors. And the last funny note I'll leave with you here at the very end is right after I got done covering myself in mud, sitting in front of the fire to let it dry on my body, I looked over to see a family walking through uh, the trails that were connected to this place that we were staying in and they just saw me covered in mud around this big fire and I just stood there and stood, stared at them because there was no way to make that normal. And like, it was just really funny because they just saw me, stared for a second, I heard, what the fuck? And then they left. Oh, and until the hall. <laughs>